from Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, singer-songwriter Andrew Bird on the breakthroughs that come from hard times. Those moments when you're running on fumes, there's things to learn. You're so broken down and uninhibited that crazy stuff comes out. Andrew Bird sort of defies classification. He's known for these really dynamic live solo performances, a kind of combination of indie folk and jazz. But he was actually trained as a classical violinist. Andrew started out playing with bands in Chicago in the late 90s after college, and he found himself in the middle of a really interesting period in music. This was a time when swing and jazz and punk and garage rock were influencing a bunch of different bands, everyone from the Squirrel Nut Zippers to the White Stripes to the Strokes. Andrew Bird was part of that scene, including as a member of the Squirrel Nut Zippers. But then Andrew kind of disappeared for a little bit. He holed up in a farm a few hours outside of Chicago and spent months at a time alone searching for a new way to write songs. And he came out of it with a totally new approach to his music. Abstract lyrics, looping violins, wildly fantastic whistling. And then he took these experiments on the road and became legendary for his solo performances over the years, where even the songs themselves could change from night to night. Andrew's produced 17 studio albums, including his latest called Inside Problems. In my conversation with Andrew Bird, he'll talk about how, as a kid, he felt extremely shy most of the time, but completely at ease in front of a recital hall full of people. He'll talk about why he gravitates towards performances that feel like they could go very wrong at any moment. And you'll hear him deconstruct one of his songs for us in real time, showing how he builds these intricately layered compositions out of just voice and violin. That's all coming up after this break. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. Our newest series looks at the downfall of Spiro Agnew, the former vice president under Richard Nixon, and the target of a federal investigation that had the potential to cause a constitutional crisis. Listen to American Scandal on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Andrew Bird has been playing the violin basically for his entire life and even graduated from Northwestern University with a classical degree in violin performance. He grew up in Chicago along the North Shore. His mom dreamed of having her kids play classical music. So from a young age, Andrew was learning violin through the Suzuki method. When you're four, you're not fully conscious yet. Yeah. So you'd go to the teacher, sometimes just bow, because it's a a Japanese method and it has certain traditions from that culture so you bow to the teacher and go home or you bow or you play and you start with a cracker jack box with a ruler taped to it uh, before they hand a kid something that's worth any money right and uh you stand on a little disc that has little footprints where your feet are supposed to go and you go through the positions and it's all very like methodical and and they, they just sort of gently mold you over the years yeah if you're doing something incorrect they'll kind of Fix it for you. Did it take a while of being forced to do it before you were like, I like doing this? Um, You know, what really helped was my mom played violin with me, like as an act of solidarity. So it wasn't like, I could never say, why don't you play it? You know, we played together and for the first year or two, and then you quickly surpass the parent because you have very you know, malleable neuropathways and the, the parent is struggles much more with it. But, you know, it's just something I did twice a week, just play music and then you just kind of play around outside. And it was just not never like a big deal. Then, you know, when I started to be like seven or eight, I started to become aware of that, the idea of the prodigy mm. or the gifted child, you know, that was being pushed and there were these kids that were six years old and could play Tchaikovsky and 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 you were not one of those kids. 
I wasn't really a prodigy per se, though there was a, I had a nice tone and my teacher said I was musical, but that mm-hmm. was such an abstract word, you know? Yeah. It's just when it, when the pressure started to build and there was this couple that would train prodigies that wanted to take me on into their studio. And my mom said, no, hmm. like she could see that it was maybe too much, like unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I'd gone that route, I might have burned out and not stuck with it. But the Suzuki method is responsible for like the kind of musician that I am today wow. because I learned completely by ear up until high school. And then suddenly I had to read music and orchestras. Wow. But the pure form of the method is learning by ear. And some people have a problem with that. I think it's awesome. I think it's the way it should be. It's like folk music. Um, I guess around 16 was when you got your first sort of quote unquote serious violin. Mm -hmm. Um, So you were really, I mean, I have to assume that if if I had known you as a child, like if you were a playmate or something, Mm -hmm. you were like, everyone kind of knew you as a kid who was pretty good at violin. Yeah, I think if kids knew about it, I'm not sure they really knew about Mm -hmm. it. I was, when I had my first like, music class in junior high, I got a C. Huh. <laughs> like I'd, I, but I came in one day and played a concerto for everybody and everyone was knocked out, <laughs> but I I didn't really understand the method they were trying to teach me. Were you a quiet kid? Extremely, yeah. But part of being, a, you know, learning violin is, is the recital, is going in front of the parents and the other kids once a year, twice a year and performing. Was that relatively easy for you to do? Oh, yeah. I was always um, incredibly uncomfortable in the group. And once I got in front of the group, I was completely at ease. Wow. Like if I had to give a book report, it was the same thing, you know. Um, so in the group, in the group, mm-hmm. was there was discomfort. Yeah. But standing in front of the group, it was, it was okay. Yeah, I was safely in front of, I was safely apart from everyone and, and knew what to do. Yeah. I mean, clearly, um, it, it is sort of that, that decision by your mom when you were a, a small kid paid off. You went on to study music in college to study uh, music performance and, and presumably violin. I mean, you were essentially, you were at Northwestern, but you were essentially in music school. Yeah. Describe what you remember about that time because that really, I mean, it's four years of conservatory. What does that mean? I mean, you know, we've seen, we've seen the, obviously the, the, the movies, the films about, um, what was that one with Miles Teller, um, where he's a drummer, um, I can't remember it. Oh, uh, whip, whip Whiplash. Whiplash, yeah. You see that, right? And you have this sense of what that means. And there are actually some, I mean, Charlie Puth went to uh, Berkeley College of Music. Like he studied at, at essentially the conservatory. Mm-hmm. So there is a there's a, a not just a rhythm, but there's an intensity for four years, right? Yeah. I mean, it's almost like being on a, on a, on a Division One sports team because you're probably practicing 30, 40 hours or playing music a week. Oh, yeah. Like eight hours a day of, of in the practice studio. Um, it's it's pretty intense. And, uh, and I took it very seriously. I mean, there were... I felt like my fellow music students like had double majors in like engineering or something to fall back on or in education or whatever and they didn't seem to they did the work but they didn't really they didn't seem as stressed out as I was I was like very like I needed to prove something and I was all in with the violin and in this just romantic struggle with the instrument to master it I read that while you were, um, I mean, I think the year you graduated from college, you released your first solo album. And you had written, I guess, a couple years before, um, a song that really kind of became your first song, the um, Nothing Doing, Nothing Doing Waltz. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Not spelled nothing doing, spelled a slightly different way. Um, And it's remarkable to hear it because... To me, it sounds like Irish Appalachian, like almost like it, it could be in a, in a Ken Burns film. It was beautiful, 
music. Tell me about what you were influenced by. How were you making that kind of music when you were 22 years old? I wrote that song when I was 18 on my family farm in Western Illinois on the front porch. Hmm. And uh, at the time I was in orchestra and violin studio in this classical world. But on weekends, I would go to pubs in Chicago, which there's quite a few Irish pubs and a lot of expats. And I would play in the sessions um, the, where there's a circle of musicians sharing tunes. And um, I also was very influenced by Ken Burns' wow. uh, Civil War soundtrack, that Jay Unger tune that became like the- Yes, the, the theme. The theme yeah. of that series. I played that it so many weddings and funerals. Wow. You wouldn't believe like it, that, that paid my rent, that song for <laughs> the early years. Um, yeah. Ashokan, it's, it's called Ashokan Spring. Right? Ashokan Farewell. Ashokan Farewell, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just a really beautiful, simple Appalachian, Anglo Irish type tune. So the first tune I wrote where I'm like, you know, writing original lyrics and was this thing called the Nothing Doing just amusing myself with the lyrics about a a dog with a nasal disease and you know it was just a lark and at the same time i was also i mean i was had my fingers in so many different things at the same time i was in a i joined like a punk ska band in college and uh we were playing you know meters tunes and we were playing we covered come on eileen and oh it's a beautiful song uh, yeah <laughs> we did rio by uh Duran, Duran Duran and yeah. and then a bunch of like ska tunes and it didn't make it it was one of those college kitchen sink bands I think it's I think it's worth for a moment I know you've got your violin with you it's worth for a moment if you can just play a few seconds of what nothing doing sounded like and if you can can you give us a sense of what the punk ska band sounded like I'm just I'm just curious how you were doing <laughs> both of those things at the same time I don't, I don't know if I can do the latter for you but <laughs> I do, even though I haven't played this in years, I I think I won't have any trouble remembering it. I mean, it's it's almost as if putting that out into the world and then being in a punk ska band was like a channel, right? That that it's like opening completely different parts of your brain up. Yeah. I mean, I was interested in so much at the same time and just ravenous for new things. So I was just jumping from one scene to the next. You know, I got into sort of early gypsy jazz around that mm. time and... I was just all over the place and just just trying to soak it all up. And that went through into my early to mid 20s. Like yeah. I'd say like 16 to 26 was this like binge. I I just couldn't be satiated. I know that you I think when you were in your early 20s you met Jimbo Mathis, the guy who's sort of the sort of the creative force behind scroll nut zippers and and anyone who remembers the 90s remembers that band and how they kind of revived swing music um mm -hmm. you know along with the gap ad and movies and stuff but that band was mm -hmm. really at the center of it um and that had a huge impact on you right i mean you you not only started to collaborate with them but that really you began to make music that sounded like that yeah at the time i was had one of my first gigs as a musician i was playing at a renaissance fair <laughs> in southern wisconsin and playing irish music that passes for uh, medieval music. <laughs> and me and the the dulcimer player and the flute maker had a little trio going on with our blousey shirts and Ren Faire garb. And we went down to a festival in North Carolina where the Zippers happened to be playing. And I gave them a tape that I'd made of me making playing gypsy jazz. Hmm. And they desperately needed someone to fill in on their trumpet parts. But I just learned the trumpet parts on violin and played with them in Chicago. And then that started like a, the next couple of years of sort of being in that band and yeah. recording with them. And But what I learned from them 
was not so much about jazz. It was more about rock and roll, hmm. honestly. Just putting on a, on a show. I mean, that band put on a very physical, wild, entertaining show. Yeah. And I just remember sitting, being side of the stage watching them play a show about before I came on to join them. And Jimbo was like hopping on one foot at the edge of the stage while playing a guitar solo. And I was just, and people were just going crazy. And I just like, you know, I always had a certain, I always liked to play music that, that grabbed, I had a violin teacher in college. Um, and at one of the convocations I play, I think I played Ashokan Farewell and people really liked it. And yeah. he, was, he got really jealous and mad at me. He was like, all you want is applause. <laughs> He was Russian. And I was like, well, you know, not exactly, but I want to connect with people. I want to, you yeah. know, um, it's not like I want to ever dumb it down for that sake. It's just that I, I have certain, for lack of a better word, like popular pop inclinations. Yeah. Did you, when you saw... Jimbo and Scroll Nut Zippers performing like that, you know, wildly, you know, p- performing, jumping on stage and dancing. And did you see yourself being capable of doing a version of that? Um, yes. I mean, at the time I was playing in, in bands and, and sweaty, dark clubs and people were dancing and it was kind of a whiskey fueled wildness to it. And yeah. I really enjoyed that. I, I like those sweaty rock club shows. Did you have any inhibitions about it? About moving and about moving your body and about... Well, I am holding like kind of a priceless instrument in my hand sometimes. If I, I, want, I kind of think if I weren't, there'd be more of an Iggy Pop that would come out of me. But it, I am kind of hamstrung by, by what I'm holding in my Fair hands. Enough. Fair enough. Yeah. You, you went on to start your own sort of swing ensemble... Um, Andrew Bird's Bowl, Bowl of Fire. I um, what's remarkable about it is certainly in in you know in, in the late nineties when you were putting out your early work. It's, I mean, you could be in a in in nineteen thirties Paris. It's there's a very French jazz you know thirties the banjo and the mm-hmm. trumpet sound to what you're producing at the time. Yeah. Does that is that in any way does it resemble what how you would describe it in any way? Yeah. I mean, it was all. Early 20th century stuff we were into. I got, I got really into the original cast recording of the Three Penny Opera mm. and the sound of that recording. And I got really obsessed with the way those records sounded. And we made our first couple Bowl of Fire albums in New Orleans with the old RCA ribbon microphones and, and just kind of fetishized all that kind of old stuff. Yeah, so I got swept up in the sort of cinematic romance of, of another time yeah for sure but i also just i also loved great jazz how, help me understand how you and I, I mean this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that that artists all artists i think all people we evolve right over time and we experiment mm-hmm. we, we we become different versions of ourselves but but when you're a public artist and you put music out you can trace that because you can hear something that somebody does when they're 18 and something that they do when they're 50 mm-hmm. and so you can see that evolution happen and you know that progression happen over time and in 2001 i think it was 2001 you released um a record called the swimming hour and it's really different like i hear that record and i'm like okay Going from, you know, a Shokin style, you know, Irish music to 30s swing jazz is interesting and a, definitely a, but this was like, this felt like a, a moon leap. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. like a, a completely different artist on that record. Uh, yeah. Describe what you were, the sound you wanted to make and how that happened. Um, yeah. I mean, that that record was still under the name Bowl of Fire and I probably should have drop that at that point because it was a marked <laughs> departure from the first two albums. I was already ready to move on from the early swing thing, mm. even when I was making Oh, The Grandeur. I just thought I had some idea in my head that I should stick to my guns for at least two albums stylistically before I branch off. And that, that was kind of a mistake. But with Swimming Hour, yeah, I was breaking my own rules. You know, I was kind of 
trying to offend myself, my own sensibilities. I remember when I was working on that album, my engineer that I worked with on the first two albums was playing some Fleetwood Mac. And I still found that to be way too commercial. And yeah, I thought it was cheesy. Hmm. I was still it kind of had a very specific thing I wanted to do. But I, I did want to kind of break my own rules, kind of offend myself, maybe offend the people that I'd been listening to me for a while, what small audience I had at that point. I mean, that time, that was a time where you had like a, the kind of this revival of American rock and roll. You had the White Stripes and the Strokes and that whole New yeah. York scene starting to come out, Interpol and these kinds of bands. Mm -hmm. Was that influencing the way, you, were you listening to that music? I wasn't listening to that music very much. I, I did pick up an old um, compilation of like garage rock that I listened to a lot around that time. And uh, no, I was listening to a lot of Stax record stuff, but I was aware of it. I was aware of it. I thought, man, me and Jimbo could probably show them how it's done. Because <laughs> I, I, was, I was watching it from, from a distance and thinking, yeah, all right. That that record got a nine out of ten rating from Pitchfork, which is incredible. But it was still hard for you to find an audience at that time. Were you, I mean, still early in your career? But were you frustrated? Were you? Did that bother you? Did it worry you? You know, up until a certain point around two thousand, I was pretty happy to be a local regional artist. Yeah, like I said, playing those the sweaty rock club thing, and I wasn't really. The ambition thing hadn't really kicked in. But then I, you know, I found myself in Chicago around that time. You know, there's Bloodshot Records. I was hanging out with Nico Case and, and the Mekons and Kelly Hogan and, and it's, you know, a certain kind of alt country scene. Because that was, yeah, it wasn't exactly what I fit into, but those were the most entertaining people to hang out with at that time and good people. But yeah, I could see like around that time, like Nico was being sort of groomed to be big and Ryan Adams was being groomed. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, why not me? <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't immune to those ambitions. When we come back in just a moment, how that emerging ambition leads Andrew Bird not to LA or New York City, but to a barn in rural Illinois where solitude helps him discover an entirely new approach to music. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Do you spend sleepless nights worrying about being submerged in quicksand, being attacked by an unrelenting swarm of killer bees, or how you'd outswim an angry giant shark? I'm Anthony Atamanik, and I'm here to tell you to stop worrying and let me, an anxious and overly informed comedian, be your guide to solving your most worrisome what-ifs. Don't panic! A new comedy podcast from Wondery leans into our most absurd anxieties and diffuses them with humor and actual advice for how to deal should you find yourself facing your fears. You'll laugh, learn, and possibly sweat profusely. Enjoy Don't Panic! on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Don't Panic early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. So in his late 20s, Andrew Bird moves to a farm his family owned out in the northwestern corner of Illinois right near the border with Iowa and Wisconsin. And he winds up spending a couple of years grounded there. But at first, his new life was way more than he bargained for. I left Chicago, just put a lot of my stuff in storage. I didn't even bring my record collection out, out to this barn that I fixed up. And my intention was just to go out there to have a home studio in the barn and, and make an album. And uh, then I was like, realized too late that none of my friends had cars to come visit me. So I was kind of, I was, I'd be out there for two or three weeks at a time and not, not really talk to anybody and just 
get up in the morning, get the eggs from the chickens, make an omelet and coffee. And then I would just make music until the sun went down. Like I was in a very feverish kind of state and I was so isolated that it really the unintended outcome of that, I thought I was going to make an album, but it was really, I found out what, what I had going on inside me without all the albums and all the movies and the cinematic romance that I'd been caught up in before, just simply what came to the surface in my collective experiences and without any distractions, without my band coming out to bring their influences on things. Because I'm, when I play with other musicians, I listen to them and I'm deferential to them hmm. in a way. Like I respond to the other musicians and that's how it should be. Yeah. But you sometimes can get steered in a different direction by your bass players being obsessed with the kinks or something like that, you know? I mean, we often hear about, um, and I think a lot of us have experienced this, which is the collaborative process really can fire off like neurons, right? And it can, I mean, if you watch that Beatles documentary, that, you know, that 15 hour Beatles documentary, you see them collaborating and pr producing just gold, right? Just, just mm -hmm. genius. But what's interesting about what you are talking about is that it's the, it's the complete opposite of that, which is that, that, that the solitude mm -hmm. and the, maybe the loneliness was also a process that you needed to experience to fire off those or, or certain other, you know, creative neurons. Absolutely. I mean, I had to really clear the room to find out what I really had to say as a musician. And uh, it helped a little tiny piece of technology kind of helped shape that too in the, in the sense that I could started looping around that time. The loop pedal, you started to, to yeah. play around with that. And that was relatively new-ish as, right, as a technology new, at that new point. New-ish, yeah. It's, it had been around for a few years and I locked on to one in particular that I would play a phrase, click the, the pedal, and then it would keep playing that old phrase as I layered on top of it. But the trick to that pedal was that it would fade out the early layers as you lay in new ones. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but that's very critical to how that worked for me in that it could evolve over. I would Sometimes I would keep the loop going for several hours and it would become nothing like what I started with. And I could take this otherwise linear instrument of the violin and create this whole new world. And I got an octave pedal and I was playing pizzicato bass lines and I would clip the violin and play it like a guitar and get these rhythmic accents and I'm not a big gearhead, but I, I found this really blew things open for me. It also has restrictions. You can only do 13 or 26 seconds phrase. Hmm. And when you want to move on to a new idea, you have to erase it forever. Wow. You can't store it. So it stays ephemeral and free flow and you can't get too precious about your ideas. And so I, it, it was a really experimental period. And uh, I was just sort of going for long walks in the Mississippi Valley, upper Mississippi Valley of, near the Mississippi River and coming back and, and composing. And, and then I would get in my van and, and go straight off on tour. So wow. I was not talking to anyone, making music, experimenting, going straight to a stage where I'd play solo. And um, yeah, it was just kind of a wild, lonely time, productive. I know that you don't have the pedal with you, and and so, but anyone listening should watch a TED talk you gave in 2010 because it's it's really instructive and really amazing. Can you just play like show me how you would do it with your violin? Like how would you start to create those loops? Yeah. Um, well, there's like a, a song from the latest album that that's classic uh, pizzicato loop that I would set up where I play. Sorry, buttons are vibrating. And I'd click it here and go. And then I'd 
play a bass line. Like, and that's the kind of rhythmic accent. Hmm. And then that's a very simple chord progression, but then you can play like on top of that in, um, you know, you could play for hours on top of that, just kind of inventing different melodies that could go over it. So I'll just... Yeah. Uh, all the while this... And then uh, I'll sing over that. I don't want to run on your shoulders and put you in the hospital. I just want to roll away boulders as I said it wasn't possible, etc. And so you can set up maybe two thirds of the song is is got this bed underneath it. And then when you go to the chorus, you either have to make the loop for the chorus, or you have to make the loop for the verse. You can't do yeah both. Um, so there's a lot of strategizing of how to make it work. And uh, yeah, I, you think I, I've been doing this forever. Yeah. And I never get, I never get tired of it. <laughs> And I quickly tried it on stage as soon as I could. And I figured no one would buy this. They would think, where's the band? You know, yeah. this is, I paid money for this. What's, what's this? So I was pretty insecure about it at first. And you were improvising, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, but the thing is, like, you, it becomes a whole different kind of performance because there's this element of that things could really go off the rails at any moment. And, uh, you kind of embrace that, you know, and it helps kind of keep you on your toes as a performer, having that element that things could could go off the rails. And I, I, I really enjoy that. I kind of cultivate it. How did you, I mean, even when you're touring, I know there were times where you were doing like 200 gigs in a year. I don't, I mean, yeah. right? Small venues and, and festivals and just constantly on the road. And and there are times. I mean, obviously, when you're when you're working at such a clip, you you mm -hmm. just inevitably will get better. It's like standing at the free throw line. You're just going to get better over time. But you're also going to get. You're going to go backwards sometimes. Like you're going to have a bad. You're going. You're not going to perform as well as you wanted to. Or yeah, it didn't didn't quite work. When you went through that, certainly that you know initial phase of performing with a loop pedal. Um. Did you ever go through through phases where you just thought you were not getting better? Um, huh. That's an interesting... Or did you always feel like just doing it more and more just made you better at it and, and made you a better musician? I... The only thing I dealt with was, was burnout because mm -hmm. I was so afraid... Because once I started doing this solo looping thing, it just didn't sound like much else out there. So I, I think that's when people started paying attention and coming to shows all of a sudden. Yeah. And I was got a little panicked, like I've got to make hay because this is going to go away at any moment. So I just took every possible opportunity and I ran myself into the ground. And I probably, looking back, wasn't playing my best because I was just running on fumes. Yeah. But um, those moments when you're running on fumes, there's things to learn. Like, so you're so uh, broken down and uninhibited that crazy stuff comes out, you know? Yeah. The, the total rock bottom I hit was in, uh, was in Belgium, in Ghent, one night. And I was just really, I just couldn't do it anymore. I just like hit a wall and I could feel like I wasn't connecting with the audience. And I just got in the van. I remember just lying down on the floor of the van and looking out the window and uh, starting to kind of laugh. <laughs> <laughs> like I was so empty, I, I just could only laugh. And I saw these clouds in the moonlight and I said, oh, well, look at those beautiful mountains. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm in Belgium. There's no mountains in Belgium. <laughs> and that became the seed of like a new, uh, a new song uh, called Mistaking. It was called um, Dance Karee, but the chorus is like, here we go, mistaking clouds for mountains. So even like the lowest moments become like these opportunities for, for new ideas to come in. 
Um, where where do you find your? I, I I've read that um, you know you're not so interested in the idea of narrative in a song because I think I'm paraphrasing, but you said something to the effect of like you can't really develop characters. You can't tell a real story in three minutes, right? Um, yeah. There are there are great narratives or weird narratives and and tons of music. Tangled up in blue. What a weird story, yeah. especially if you start to read Bob Dylan's lyrics. But I mean, it's a story, and you're following yeah. this character. Hurricane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's lots of good examples of narrative songs. They tend to be kind of on the long side. Yeah. And in my experience, you know, narrative, it's a different part of the brain that's getting tapped into. It's like someone's telling me a story right now, and you're following the beginning, middle, and end, and the arc of it, and then it's over, and you think, I've heard the story now, now I'm going to move on. Hmm. You know, not that you don't want to listen to Hurricane 50 times, but, you know, when you're in story mode, it's like you consume the story and you digest it and you move on. For me, what I've always listened to as a music listener and listening to songs is not for that so much. It's for a little moment of like a tone and texture hmm. and a syllable and a vowel all coming together in this moment of great, like, it all comes together, the meaning, the sound, everything. And I can't put my finger on exactly why it moves me, but it does. And sometimes it's just like a four bar segment that just knocks me out. How, how do you, I mean, it's a, it's a hard question to answer, but how do you, I mean, can you kind of walk me through the process of, of making a song? I mean, do you, you you've got your violin, and what what mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you begin by just thinking of a sound, or or or, or playing a sound, and like how does um, how, how, how does your process work? Well, I don't have office hours where I sit down and like a writer and and start um, looking at the blank page and start tapping away and seeing what happens. I am just paying attention to the things that are popping up into my head when I'm doing mundane tasks like doing the dishes or mm -hmm. you know the things that when you're not working that keep coming to the surface and you're whist I'm whistling or humming or just playing back in my head and uh, if it keeps coming back usually it's like it might be triggered by some sensory thing mm -hmm. like f for instance every time I got into a New York City taxi and that it, maybe it was the air freshener <laughs> or whatever it would trigger the same melody Every time you can't not do something with that, you yeah. Know, if it keeps coming back like that, so then I think, okay, this is a great melody, I need to sing it. And then, best way I can describe it is like I sort of point that melody at something that's that I've been thinking about or it's something that's important to me at mm -hmm. that time, or just some concept that's been coming to the surface a lot, and then. I keep having them, the melody and the concept, like talk to each other and see what kind of words get teased out of there. And a lot of times, especially with this last album during the pandemic, like insomnia, middle of the night, lying there with hours. I know I'm not going to sleep for another hour or two. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to spiral in my head and I think, okay, let's make the best of this time. I'm stuck here. Uh, and so I take that internal dialogue and that, those personal demons that are driving me crazy and kind of put them to work and, and, you know, pull up the melody in my head and play it back and then have that internal dialogue keep trying to hit the melody until something gets stuck in the shape of the melody. Do you, um, are there times where you're stuck? Or you can't. I mean, you've produced like, or been part of like twenty-five records. You, you must have written more than a thousand songs, and maybe thousands of songs in your career. Uh, I would say hundreds. I don't know about thousands, but but many of those songs yeah. I've never seen the light of day. They're they're, they're tossed in, yeah. in, in the in the trash. Exactly. Um, but do you go, do you go through periods where you are stuck, where you cannot produce? You just it's not coming out of your head. Um. I go through periods where I'm – the only thing that, that dogs me is the industry schedule, how that slows down the creative process. 
It's not something that you determine. I mean, you're so prolific, but you're, I mean, so it seems like it just comes out. But what do you mean by the yeah. industry schedule? Oh, well, just, just the release. You know, I, I made this last album last May, and it was done this September, and now it's coming out in yeah, June. Right. So there's a very fallow period of like where I've finished it, and I'm not performing yet, and then the gears kind of grind to a halt and I'm mm. not, you know, there's no outlet for new material. What do you do at that time? Uh, it's not my favorite time. Uh, you know, I, I struggle a bit um, because those those voices, those personal demons don't have a magnet, which is the song is kind yeah. of the the thing that kind of keeps everything in, in line. And so they run amok a little more. But as far as like writer's block or being stuck, there's songs that I get fixated on that are maybe not healthy. I'm just I'm just whipping, uh, <laughs> to, you know, for no reason. Um, that you can't you can't you just can't finish. You can't make work. That I just keep reworking and reworking, and yeah, I can't quite get them to work. Um, and usually it's the ones that have the most promise at the beginning where I think, oh my God, I've written a, I've written this song that's going to get America singing the same tune. <laughs> you yeah. know? It, everyone's going to be whistling this one. And then that pressure of, of like trying to make it realize its potential sometimes does it in. Um, how do you um, think about struggle? Is struggle necessary to produce art or do you think that's just nonsense i think that's mostly nonsense i ha i do have those tendencies to uh to suffer and struggle not because i think that makes better art but just because that's the way i'm wired yeah you know i'll push a little farther than I have to. I mean, at a certain point, I, I, in the early years, I never went on vacation. The idea of going on vacation was so um, just indulgent and perverse to me. And then now these days, like every time I, vacations are good for business. Like as soon as I go somewhere else and clear everything, then the ideas start coming yeah. really quick. And you know, it's just like, I think in this period before I'm about to put out an album, I know it's going to be another two or three years before I put out another one. It's like, um, and I feel like I'm in this sort of fallow period and I don't enjoy it. Um, I know once I get out there performing and I take a break, it's just inevitable. It's going to come. It's like, I never worry because I, you wake up and you're suddenly just a new melody is your new best friend for a couple of months and you just whittle away at it, at it. How do you organize your thoughts? Do you, do you, or do, do they just stay in your head or do you write them down? I try to keep them in my head as long as possible. In the last couple of years, I've made a lot of voice memo recordings. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of recordings of me like on an airplane and you hear the, all the background noise and I'm like whistling into the phone because since I got up that morning, something is just like, grinding in my head um but lyrics too i try to keep things in my head because they once you start pick up an instrument or you pick up a pencil and start writing stanzas there's like a physical memory there's like a form that starts to impose itself on it if it stays in your head the more chances it's going to be it's going to remain odd you know it won't conform to the eight bar phrase and that's a good thing we're going to take another quick break, but when we come back, two major changes in Andrew Bird's life lead him to write some new songs that might have annoyed a younger Andrew Bird. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. 
So it's 2012, and shortly after the birth of their son, Andrew Bird's wife is diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Now, these two events happening in quick succession, well, they change his life, no question, and they also redirect the course of his music. I needed to get out of my head. I needed something mm. grounding, you mm. know. And what I was doing lyrically back then was was definitely like sound over meaning. Yeah. And now I think these very real things that that life has dealt to us have caused me to want to um you know, to really appreciate the real succinct songwriting of, of like a John Prine or yeah. Towns Van Zandt or, you know, just like when someone boils something down into a really, uh, just a couple words that have so much meaning. That's that's what I'm trying to do. And that time with the birth of our child and the illness, um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just stay in my sort of internal navel-gazing world during that time. It was impossible. It was just it'd be conspicuous not to write about these, these important, heavy things that were happening. The album, uh, the album was called Are You Serious? And I think it, it came out about, around about that time. And then there was a song on it called Puma, um, which, which kind of deals in kind of an indirect way with what you and your family were going through at, at that moment. Um, can you tell me about writing that song and, and how you conveyed what was going on in your life? Um, that was kind of way more confessional than I was ever comfortable. I never really, that's why I kind of called the album, Are You Serious? Is because I, my response in the past to the confessional singer songwriter was like, really? <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't understand, uh, singing something so, Painful, like I, this is going back to kind of that emo period in the '90s, mm. late '90s, like of you know really opening up a vein on right. on stage, and I would just kind of be incredulous sometimes. And then you know these things happen in life, and you're like, well, how can I not write about this? And then it's suddenly you're writing this confessional, my version of a confessional song. And I'm curious about what influences the things that you write, right? Because ly lyrics are one thing and music is another thing. And, um, and and first of all, do you, I mean, it's a sort of a strange question, but is one more important than the other to you? Lyrics versus melody? Mm -hmm. um, I would have to say I really come down more on the side of melody. But like I said, I can get something stuck in my head, just something I fixate on that is either a melody or I can get fixated on a word just mm. as much, like the hook of a of a word and the way it sounds and what it means or what it could mean. Songwriting is interesting because there is no easy parallel in other disciplines of, say, a novelist. Yeah. Um, I I envy novelists and that they can ha hang on to a through line through a whole massive work and, and the discipline that it takes to do that. But it just doesn't quite apply to the three and a half, four minute song in yeah. my experience. It's such a, um, you know, you could take all that, all that rigor and discipline and your editors and and really not make a better song. Yeah. I know on your, your newest album, there are um, all kinds of themes. Um, there's mythology, the stories of Icarus and, and Daedalus and Orpheus, Joan Didion. You have a, a, at least two songs. One, I think, is a is a, a riff off her name. And then another song um, also influenced by Joan Didion and Slouching Towards Bethlehem. Um, do, is that – is do you – are you constantly reading? Are you searching for source material that might factor into how you produce your work and how you make art? I just, I've become like, as I get older and older, like even more of a 
rabid reader. Um, yeah, I just read every night, like for a couple hours. And uh, so, yeah, there's definitely, I was reading uh, The Year of Magical Thinking when mm -hmm. I wrote um, Lone Didion. And that was actually from a story that a friend of mine told me who was working at a restaurant and would seat Joan Didion and her husband at their regular table every Saturday night. And around that time, I think it was December 2004 when, or was it 2002? I can't remember. Um, she came in with her husband, orders exactly the same thing, um, quite a bit of alcohol. And, um, and then she didn't stop coming in around that December. And then, then she finally came in in late January by herself and ordered the same thing. And this was right, right when she lost her husband mm. and was losing her daughter. And it's all beautifully chronicled in, in that book. Is there a moment where, where, I mean, when you're reading something and, and, and it happens that, that an idea comes to your head that you want to make part of what you do, or does it happen later on? Like while you're reading, you know, a, a Joan Didion essay, is there something in there that, that you can remember that resonated with you at, at a moment and you, you really understood at that moment that, that you wanted to, to write a song about, sort of rooted in, in an idea that she raises? Um, I've had experiences where I'm reading a writer that is writing the thoughts of the character that is true to the way I think and the way that I write a song. Like George Saunders, for instance, the way he does a character and they're sort of tangential, seemingly random channel switching thoughts. And I, I think with songwriting, that three or four minute song, like what keeps me coming back to the, that form is how tangential and digressive it can be. And how like you could be in a New York cab and a, and a air freshener could trigger a melody. And mm -hmm. then you look out and you see an airplane and it makes your, you think of this and then you yeah. think of this and you look at a, you're in a bookstore and you look at a spine and you of a book and you see a title is exactly the phrase you were thinking at that moment. It's all these like taking all these things in your universe that you see and hear and all these sensory things and kind of organizing it into song form. Um, obviously thematically there's there's a lot I've I've had a chance to listen to this record and uh at the time of our recording here it's still I have a, an advanced version of a copy of it mm -hmm. um yeah and there obviously there are a lot of literary themes on this record um tell me about how you would describe this record you know what, what is it about well i mean i thought that the title inside problems was appropriate that was just something I wrote down years ago that just I thought was funny that your world could be broken down into such a simplistic thing of like inside problems and outside problems, you know. But that I used that title because of this idea of the internal world, you know, the internal dialogue, the just beneath the surface, the threshold between, you know, the internal world that you have going on and then projecting it out through the threshold of your body out to this thing we call society or the group, mm. you know, going back to what we're talking about being uncomfortable in the group and then being separate from the group and being finally at ease once you're apart from it. And that's been like a constant, like I've been puzzling through that for years. That comes up now because isn't that kind of what we're all struggling with Yeah. in the last few years is like our identity is so caught up in these ideas of personal freedom and the individual. But then we've got issues of like public health or climate change that we're not going to get past if we're just sticking to those old ideas of like self-reliance and, yeah. and the, per, the individual like that rugged um, Self, succeeding yes, right. for themselves yeah the manifest destiny all these things that that are part of the american myth and the american identity that aren't working for us anymore so the the album's dealing with that it's dealing with with 
change and metamorphosis in the in the song Inside Problems. I mean, one of my my personal favorites that is kind of different from the rest is is um, the night before your birthday. Mm-hmm. That's one um, that's just just a little more personal and less less concerned with these political type things that we're talking about. I, but um, I wonder. I don't want to put you on the spot because I know that yeah. it requires a lot of production but are you able to play a little bit of that stripped down version of that song for us uh yeah that's the melody um on the night before your birthday i sit down to write this song but i wasn't sure what to say Afraid these words would come out wrong That you always be my darling Till the end of measure time Like that pair of nesting starlings Growing more and more entwined Anyway, it's like It's, beautiful. it's just a, it's a beautiful song To write something like that, that song Night before your birthday, this that's simple and and heartfelt is a struggle for me. Andrew, do you feel like creative? We t- we think about. I think oftentimes we, we sort of mythologize creativity, like it's this unattainable thing that is only accessible and and available to you know the very few. I don't believe that. Mm-mm. Do you? Do you? Do you think that creativity is something that is accessible to to anyone? I do, and I feel like anyone with a just a Casio keyboard could make you cry. You don't need to have played violin for 30 years to earn the right to connect with an audience. I think there's a lot of myths of talent is a word I don't like. Gifted is another word I don't mm-hmm. like. I think they're myths that just inhibit the majority of the people that say, oh, I don't have talent, I don't have a gift. It's like, I don't buy that. It's maybe you haven't been conditioned, but every human is is dealt more or less the same cards for the most part. If you were to go back to your 22-year-old self when you were just really kind of, you know, writing your first, releasing your first record and beginning your career, what would you tell yourself now? What would you tell yourself that would make you more susceptible to opening different channels and being more creative and 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 exploring in ways that maybe you weren't doing at that time or you felt like you couldn't do at that time? What would you say to yourself? Mm, yeah, the things I the basic things I learned were just like don't do what worked before. Um as a rule, don't just, any sort of dogma doesn't usually serve you very well. Like that second record where I thought I should stick to the same program as the first for the sake of the audience's, uh, uh, I don't know why, I just talked myself into that. I feel pretty grateful that I got to follow my curiosities over all these years. And especially during the pandemic, I was so grateful that this was my job yeah. to write songs and it was my job to daydream and to make something come out of your internal world it really really helped me hold it together just being able to have that internal world really saved me that singer songwriter andrew bird Actually, that's singer, songwriter, actor Andrew Bird. In the fourth season of the FX TV series Fargo, Andrew Bird plays a character written specifically for him. Billboard magazine describes the character as a conflicted beatnik funeral parlor owner. The character's name? Thurman Smutney. You can find links to a lot of the songs we talked about in this episode and that TED Talk where Andrew demonstrates his singular use of the looping pedal at our website. You can go to thegreatcreators.com slash bird. And you can check out our whole catalog of episodes there at thegreatcreators.com. And please make sure to follow our show wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please do write a review. 
and thanks. Hey, it's Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation. For more like it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And for the audio version, just open up your favorite podcast app, search for The Great Creators, and tap follow.